Okay, uh, welcome back. My name is Dr. David Kanashko. I'm a chiropractor and the director of education and training at Meditech International. We uh, manufacture Bioflex brand of low level laser therapy photobiomodulation devices for healthcare professionals and for at home use. A bit before we get started, all the webinars are recorded so that if even if you don't have time to watch in entirety or if you want to rewatch or for future webinars, if you want to watch but can't attend, as long as you sign up for the webinar, you should receive an email that has a link uh, to watch it again on YouTube. Sometimes we get the odd glitch and someone may not receive that link. And if so, then you can always just email uh, myself or the company and we'll make sure you get that. Uh, that webinar for sure. So I thought this topic would be interesting for a lot of different people, for not just for um, athletes, but for anyone that uh, does some weight training, um, or if you treat, uh, if you're a practitioner and you treat patients uh, that play different sports or do weight training, that kind of thing, this type of information can be very helpful because we all know that uh, the, the go-to therapy for most athletes is ice. And the research behind that is quite questionable. And it's really done not because these athletes know or feel that it's uh, well-researched and, and effective. They just do it because it feels good and they're used to doing it. Uh, they'd be very surprised if they actually knew the real evidence. And so that's my goal today is, is to uh, uh, portray that evidence and understand uh, what the benefits are of cryotherapy. There is some for sure, but um, when you compare that to photobomb modulation or low-level laser therapy, uh, it really pales in comparison. So um, on that note, why don't we get started? If you have any questions along the way, type them in the Q&A uh, box. Um, the chat box is more just for generalized comments. So if you have any questions as I go along for this webinar, just type them in and I'll make sure I have time at the end to answer your questions as well. So what I'll do today is just go a little bit over the anatomy of, of muscles so we all can refresh our, our memories. And then I'll talk a bit about muscle recovery. And specifically, what we're really talking about here is delayed onset muscle soreness or DOMS. So I'll talk a little bit at length about what that is and, and some of the hypotheses about um, how, why that occurs. And then we'll discuss cryotherapy and the evidence or lack thereof evidence uh, for its use uh, for DOMS and for muscle recovery in general, and also um, how photobomb modulation or laser therapy can help. And then I'll talk specifically about our equipment and how you can achieve these results using um, Bioflex uh, arrays. And then of course, we all, always have time at the end for a Q&A. So we all are familiar with the, uh, the gross and micro anatomy of muscle tissue. We have the surrounding epimysium, the, the fibrous uh, layer, and then of course it's broken down to uh, bundles of perimyceums and then individual muscle fibers surrounded by endomyceum. Then when you look at these individual um, uh, muscle fibers, they're formed of myofibrils. And then when you look really closely, we all can re remember from our education about actin and myosin and Z disc and H zone and so on and so forth. I'm not gonna go into huge amount of detail here, although I will mention a little bit about this, especially about this histology um, and this microanatomy a little bit later when we talk about the mechanisms. So just to refresh your memory, this is what skeletal muscle fibers and muscle tissue is comprised of um, in the human body. So muscle recovery is a critical part, obviously, of sports and physical training. When you exert yourself physically, obviously, there's going to be several things that are going to occur in your body to help you recover. So if you're lifting weights, and especially weight lifting, this is where we see a lot of DOMS. It puts stress on the muscles. Uh, specifically, the stress ends up causing, oftentimes causing some soreness afterwards for a day or two, or, or sometimes even three. And this is known, of course, as delayed onset muscle soreness or DOMS. So when you exercise for a long period as well, of course, you can put pressure on your skeletal system as well. So that needs to be addressed. Lactic acid can build up. And so part of the recovery process, of course, is to clear lactic acid. That's where techniques like massage might be helpful, uh, fluid recovery, those kinds of things uh, to maintain a normal blood pH. 
So what happens in your body during recovery, muscle recovery will technically vary on the, each individual. And of course, the specific nature of what it is that you're actually doing. But in general, of course, what we tend to see is muscle fibers need to rebuild. So during recovery, these fibers will heal stronger than before the exercise, which in turn makes you stronger. So that's obviously one of the points of doing exercises to increase your strength. Of course, there is restoration of fluids. You have to make sure that that's done appropriately. And everyone is aware about proteins. And nowadays it just seems like protein, 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 protein. And you know it's all about consuming protein, but there's other nutrients that are critical as well. But protein synthesis, uh, it does need to occur for your muscle tissue to properly recover as well. Uh, the, uh, there was a study published recently by the National Institute of Health, and it stated that muscle protein synthesis in humans goes up by 50% four hours after intense resistance training. So that's a huge amount of metabolism for protein synthesis. So that's kind of why a lot of these, uh, these athletes and, and uh, weightlifters will try to consume a lot of amino acids and protein and the building blocks of protein because they know that uh, the body does ramp up into high speed for protein synthesis. So the exact, now, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about delayed onset muscle soreness because DOMS is really what we're talking about here. So the, the exact pathophysiological pathway is still not really clear for DOMS, but the primary mechanism that's currently accepted um, refers to ultra structural damage of muscle cells. And I'll talk a little bit about what that is. And that's usually due to eccentric exercise and oftentimes doing exercises that you're not familiar with. So that could be a weekend warrior kind of scenario, or specifically, let's say you haven't played tennis in a while, or you haven't played soccer in a while, or very specific sports where you go out and play them, and then you're sore the next day. Uh, and so that's really due to delayed onset muscle soreness, and that can happen quite frequently. And so essentially, this, leads, uh, this occurs because of protein degradation, cellular death, that's apoptosis, and local inflammatory response. So we all know what concentric contraction is like doing a biceps curl. Of course, isometric uh, contraction is where uh, the muscles actually contract, but they don't shorten as in concentric contraction. And eccentric is where you lengthen the muscle under stress. And that's the one that seems to evoke delayed onset muscle soreness the most. So during eccentric exercise, the external load is under some conditions greater than the force generated by the muscle fibers under concentric conditions. So the muscle fibers are actively lengthened. So this actually causes issues because the muscles produce more force at the same angular velocity than during active shortening. So during eccentric exercise, what happens is predominantly fast twitch motor units, which are called type two, are more easily damaged than type one, and they're recruited more during eccentric loading. So overall, the potential mechanism induced by eccentric exercise that leads to DOMS is due to higher muscular forces produced by less active and more damageable, if that's a word, <laughs> type two muscle fibers. So it's really because of the recruitment of type two, they're, they're in a sense more prone to damage under greater tensile strength. So during sporting activities, there are no isolated eccentric contractions that induce a pure eccentric overload. So if you're just doing a, your regular running routine, you're not gonna see DOMS typically, right? Um, and that's because you, you're not purely doing eccentrics. So it's a combination of eccentric, concentric, uh, and so forth. So instead during sports like running, change of directions, jumps, that kind of thing, e eccentric contractions are shorter and part of the entire stretch shortening cycle um, involving more time and concentric contractions. So you're not gonna really see DOMS. DOMS could also develop under submaximal conditions, uh, under moderate load conditions, particularly after when, you, when you're doing exercises that you're not familiar with or not really well coordinated to do, you might say. So using muscle groups that you don't normally do. And we all know that feeling, of course, when we go out there and exercise and do something where we haven't done that for a while. So injuries and overload to the skeletal muscle 
in sport are common sports injuries. I don't need to, to, to state that really. Uh, there's an overall incidence of 10 to 55% of all sports injuries. In competitive sports, muscle injuries and overload are responsible for a loss of training or competition days. So that's why it's critical that um, if, if you do do these activities or you treat athletes, they want to get back to their activity as soon as possible. They want to recover as soon as possible, which is why you want to do what you can to help them. Of course, they're going to gravitate to ice. Whenever you see LeBron James, whenever you see these, these athletes, they're, they're, in, they're, they're in cryotherapy baths. And we all know that uh, there's a new big thing about going in cryotherapy chambers and all the rest of it, cold showers. There, there are certain benefits to that. The science is coming out. But when you're talking specifically about muscle metabolism, recovery, reduction of inflammation, you'd be surprised that the evidence doesn't point to, um, to these uh, ice baths and, and cryotherapy. So DOMS describes an entity of ultrastructural ultra muscle damage. The progression of DOMS can be caused obviously by eccentric muscle contractions or these unfamiliar forms of exercise. When they do biopsies of these muscles, what they found is there's ultrastructural lesions, uh, including, this is technical now, uh, Z or Z band streaming and broadening, which destroys the sarcomeres and the myofibrils leading uh, to causing further damage in apoptosis, which is cellular death uh, and inflammation. So without getting too techn technical, but getting technical, uh, the issues revolve around something called Desmond proteins. Now, Desmond proteins, um, these filaments are a type of protein and they kind of are structurally um, connected all through your muscle fiber um, cell. So you can see this little diagram here in blue. I've circled the, the, the Desmond there. You can, you can see these little fibers that connect the nucleus, the mitochondria, actin and myosin. All these fibers all inter interconnect and keep everything together. And what happens is basically uh, during eccentric contraction, weightlifting, these other types of um, uh, sporting activities, these fibers get torn or sheared. And this is what causes the problems. So DOMS is associated with impaired muscular force capabilities. In other words, you all know that when you do curls, so you, say you do three times 10 reps of a heavy curling weight, then you try and lift more weights, you can barely lift it, right? And that's because it impairs the muscular force. So the next day you're much weaker. And of course, that's not good because you wanna get back to training at full force, right? Which is why you wanna recover. Okay. We all know that DOMS can cause soreness and pain and stiffness and swelling um, along with altered biomechanics and not just to the joint itself, but to adjacent joints as well. Clinical signs are obviously very variable. They range from mild to quite severe and they can subside with moderate activity to pain and inability to perform certain movements. Generally speaking, the earliest clinical manifestations begin about six to 12 hours post-exercise. This is important, I'll tell you why, is because you do not want to misdiagnose a mus muscular strain with DOMS, okay? Because you're gonna treat them differently. Here we're talking about not pain immediately after. We all know if you go out for a run or do something, you go, oh, like, you know, and you pulled your calf muscle, that's a strain. We're talking about DOMS here, which is slowly onset the next day, six, 12 hours kind of scenario. And this of course is caused by ultrastructural damage and increase. And this increases progressively to a peak pain level, roughly 48 hours to 72 hours um, from the initial onset of, of the symptoms. Now DOMS can also be associated with electrolyte imbalances, leukocyte accumulation, infiltration in the exercise muscle, uh, as well as upregulation of circulating pro-inflammatory cytokines. And if you've listened to my lectures in the past, you're well aware that photobiomodulation, um, you know, one of the ways it works is to reduce pro-inflammatory cytokines in the blood, right? So that's number one, why it's gonna be really helpful. Now satellite cells is really interesting because satellite cells are stem cells and they're located beneath the basal lamina in adult skeletal muscle fibers. And they act as precursor cells and they help play a key role in helping your muscle fibers recover structurally from this type of damage. So if you're not familiar with it, here's a skeletal muscle fiber. This is a slide I've taken from my regular training. 
that I do every month, which way, by the way, is coming up a week from this Saturday. Uh, these green little blobs represent satellite cells. When you have some micro uh, ultrastructural damage to the, um, uh, to the skeletal muscle fibers, that muscle fiber may die, it may become inflamed. Uh, it's not gonna be very healthy. So what happens is there's a series of events that trigger these satellite cells to get active and they can actually repair the damaged muscle fiber or in fact, turn into new skeletal muscle fibers. So again, don't confuse DOMS with muscle strain. DOMS, the pain begins obviously about six to 12 hours. It says one day's there, but you know, literally it's the next day after the exercise, whereas a muscle strain immediately. Usually DOMS is achy and stiff. Muscle strain, sharp pain typically. DOMS is kind of generalized overall achiness pain where a strain is like, yeah, it hurts right there where you strain that muscle. You're not gonna see a chemosis or, or a bruising with DOMS. You will typically see that with a muscle strain, okay? So keep that in mind. Now, cryotherapy is commonly described as a procedure uh, to relieve pain and decrease inflammation and muscle skeletal problems. The mechanism of cold therapy for recovery after exercise predominantly is attributed to its vasoconstrictive effect, which reduces the inflammation reactions through a decrease of the cell metabolism. Makes sense, right? It's become a rather popular technique, uh, that's uh, obviously an understatement, that is employed after intense exercise as a means of aiding the recovery and rehab of athletes. So let's look at some of the research. Um, this particular paper published in 2020, I, I, I try and get, get current stuff as, as much as possible, looking at the, um, uh, at the effects of cryotherapy on athletes' muscle strength, flexibility, and neuromuscular control. It's a systematic review. So in other words, they looked at a whole bunch of papers. I don't know what it's 20 or 30 uh, papers. Um, and they looked at this um, to see what was going on. So muscular strength, when they looked at the research, the findings of the present review appear to be clear with regard to the effect of cryotherapy and muscle strength and adaptations. In other words, they concluded, most of the reviewed studies that deal with the effects of various techniques of cryotherapy on strength revealed no surprise that cryotherapy does not positively affect power output. Stretching, flexibility. They looked at 11 trials for this particular um, uh, type of uh, scenario. And uh, they found that in these studies, it appears there's some credible research evidence that supports the notion that cryotherapy can enhance joint flexibility. Okay, so check one for cryotherapy for stretching and flexibility. Joint proprioception. Qualitative assessment of these studies appears to lead to the safe conclusion that cryotherapy does not affect the proprioception of the joints and may even have a negative effect on balance and ability of athletes. So here's the thing. If you're icing your muscles, especially in between doing act during activities or at halftime or a break, you in fact may be altering your proprioception and leading to potentially more injury. So it's definitely not recommended during an event because the evidence suggests that it can alter negatively proprioception. This particular paper called the effect of post-exercise cryotherapy on the recovery characteristics. Again, a systematic review and meta-analysis. These carry a lot more weight and evidence than a single uh, research paper, obviously. They looked at 30, 36 papers. Uh, the uh, cooling uh, or cryotherapy showed significant effects in reducing the symptoms of DOM. So it's great for feeling good, right? Ice makes you feel good in a sense of reduction of pain up to about 96 hours. Uh, and it also, the ratings of perceived exertion compared to passive control intervention. So what they're saying is that it does seem to have a subjective improvement uh, when you're going to use ice. Um, now, CWI, that's cold water immersion, that seemed to be, have over the overall best effect. In other words, if you're going to do cryotherapy, you're best to uh, put the, uh, your body in a cold ice bath compared to just an ice pack, for example. But to sum up, uh, if you look at the overall evidence that they found in this paper, um, uh, the mean temperature that seemed to have the best effect was around 10 degrees Celsius, so about 5 to 13 degrees Celsius. They reported the suggesting cooling time um, to alleviate subjective symptoms in and around 13 minutes. Okay, so that's really important because do not be sitting in that ice bath for longer than 15 minutes or so. Uh, then you actually might start to do some damage. However, 
and this is the most important part, is that there is no evidence that cooling affects any objective recovery variables in any significant way during 96 hours of recovery period. In other words, ice makes you feel great. Okay, nothing wrong with that, but there are some warnings with ice. And if you're doing it to actually help physiologically, eh, it's not happening. Sorry for the sound effect. <laughs> um, okay. This particular paper uh, looked at topical cooling or icing, and actually they set, found that it delays recovery from eccentric exercise induced muscle damage. So what they did here was uh, the study examined the influence of topical cooling. So this was not an ice immersion, it was ice on top of muscle. And they looked at muscle damage markers and hemodynamic changes during recovery from eccentric exercise. Unexpectedly, well, or expectedly, <laughs> greater elevations in circ circulating creatinine kinase, uh, MB and myoglobin above the control level were noted in the cooling trial during 48 to 72 hours of the post-exercise recovery period. So subjective fatigue feeling was greater at 72 hours after topical cooling compared with the controls. And removal of the cold pack also led to a protracted rebound in muscle hemoglobin concentration compared with controls. Measures of interleukins like 8, 10, and interleukin 1b in muscle strength during recovery were not influenced by cooling. In other words, the anti-inflammatory effect uh, was not significantly improved. So these data suggest that topical cooling, a commonly used clinical intervention, seems not to improve, but rather delay recovery from eccentric exercise-induced muscle damage. All right. This is a laser therapy webinar. So what does laser therapy do and how can it help? If you're new to my webinars, uh, you may not be familiar with this particular diagram. If you've seen some of my webinars, I oftentimes show this. This goes and shows the overall mechanism what laser therapy does. If you look at the light penetrating into a cell, it has an impact uh, via photochemical reactions on the electron transport chain or the respiratory chain, causing increased ATP production, uh, a short spike of ROS or reactive oxygen species, which uh, causes cytoprotective signaling and helps cells recover from inflammation. It also releases nitric oxide into the uh, extracellular fluid and can cause vasodilation, and it can increase uh, the perfusion of calcium in and out of the cell. So laser therapy, based on the, uh, the evidence, and there's a lot of it, uh, can positively affect growth factors, which of course are, are important for tissue regeneration, reduction of scarring and hastening recovery. Uh, it can help with uh, proliferation of certain interleukins and helps with the uh, inflammatory response. And this helps with pain and swelling. It also can help with angiogenesis and cell signaling through production of increased ATP, cyclic G uh, GMP, uh, as I mentioned, ROS and calcium flow as well. So these are all mechanisms of how laser therapy can be helpful, especially when you talk about what's happening in delayed onset muscle soreness. The other thing that's really interesting is they've done a lot of research on laser therapy and muscle regeneration. This particular paper, and I talk about this during training as well, uh, they compared control muscle fibers to muscle fibers that were radiated with red light uh, in, in the wavelength of around 630 nanometers. And what they found was, it's hard to see, but there's little tiny specks. Um, you can see a lot more of those specks on the laser treated muscle fiber. Those are stem cells or those satellite cells I mentioned earlier. So what they found is that when they irradiated ascutal muscle fibers, there was about four times as many stem cells or satellite cells compared to the control. So it actually increases the metabolism of these stem cells uh, in order to reproduce and be more av available for actually helping repair. Some of the evidence on photobomb modulation now, uh, compare it head to head to cryotherapy. This particular paper published in 2017, uh, the title is, does PBMT, is it uh, better than cryotherapy and muscle recovery after high intensity exercise, a randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled trial? So what they did there is they uh, looked at different forms of uh, photobomb modulation with or without cryotherapy or on their own. Um, and they used uh, LEDs. So those of you who think 
laser therapy is only lasers. That's not the case. That's why it's called photobiomodulation now. Um, you can use LEDs if you know what you're doing. Uh, in this particular one, they use 34 red, 30, 35 infrared LEDs, 660 uh, nanometers, 850 nanometers. Those are the close to optimal wavelengths for inducing photobiomodulation. Uh, and they used a 30 milliwatt output of power. I didn't put this in here, but they achieved around 40 to 50 joules of energy in total. Keep that number in mind because that's my recommendation a little bit later on when we talk about our equipment. So they had 40 volunteers. There was a placebo group, PBM group, cryotherapy group, combined cryotherapy, then PBMT, or PBMT, then cryotherapy uh, as well. Uh, so what they did was all the subjects performed four sessions of biceps curls uh, at 24 hour intervals during which they submitted to isometric assessment. Um, MVC is the uh, muscular uh, uh, contraction. Uh, and they also collected blood uh, five minutes uh, in the pre-exercise period and five and 60 minutes post-exercise. Maximal voluntary contraction, that's what MVC stands for. So a single treatment with PM PBMT was done. Um, and uh, it was applied after only two minutes of completing the post five minute maximal vol voluntary contraction test at the first session. The results were quite interesting. So what you're looking at here is maximal uh, voluntary contraction of the biceps uh, at the beginning pre, so they were able to do a certain amount of torque, right? N in nanometers. I'm more familiar with pounds foot of torque from like cars, kind of a bit of a gearhead, but, but I guess technically we're metric, so it's torque nanometers uh, per second or whatever. I don't know what that is. Uh, um, and you can see initially uh, where you're at with the biceps curl, then uh, they start doing the exercise and then they start treating it uh, with placebo, cryotherapy, cryotherapy, PBMT, and so on and so forth. And obviously you want to be able to uh, see if that makes any difference. And, and so what they noticed was that there's less force or torque um, when the cryotherapy or the placebo, which is a blue square and the black dots were performed. In other words, when you do nothing placebo or when you use ice, um, you had less of ability to recover and have muscular contraction force improve over time, over 24, 48 hours and 72 hours. Whereas the groups using the, the uh, combined PBMT or alone or with cryotherapy, uh, they all improved over time. Okay, and that's really important because if you're trying to get back to your activity, you're trying to get your athlete back to uh, training again, then it makes sense head to head that uh, PBMT is better than cryotherapy. In fact, what they found in this particular study was that using both was not advantageous. You're better just to use PBMT. Cryotherapy did nothing to improve the results of, of uh, cryotherapy. They also looked at a visual analog scale or pain uh, secondary to delayed onset muscle soreness. So you can see VAS uh, um, ended up going up to about an eight or nine out of 10 in the placebo and the cryotherapy group after 24, 48 hours. So even though cryotherapy feels wonderful while you're doing it, guess what? Over a period of time, when you take it off, the pain comes back. So it's really only helping temporarily. And that's the whole thing is that why are you doing something to help temporarily when you can use photobiomodulation that clearly shows uh, the VAS scale going down um, after post-treatment, remarkably quite down um, within 60 minutes. So I'm gonna recommend that you do this as soon as possible, about 60 minutes or thereabouts after the initial bout of exercise and then do it every day uh, thereafter. So the conclusion was uh, based on the above results, uh, the study demonstrates the application of cryotherapy associated with PBMT does not improve the effects of the application of PBMT, which is what I just mentioned. So in contrast, the use of cryotherapy in isolation when was unable to provide muscle recovery. Oh boy, running out of time here. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so another paper uh, from the Journal of Sport Rehab uh, is photobiomodulation modulation therapy is it more effective than cryotherapy for skeletal muscle recovery, a critically appraised topic. And just doing a summary here, the clinical bottom line is there's moderate evidence to suggest the use of PBMT over cryotherapy post-exercise to enhance muscle recovery in trained 
and untrained athletes. Shorter recovery times and increased muscle performance can be seen 24 to 96 hours following PBMT application. So the strength of the recommendation was a grade B, uh, which is very high to use, to use uh, photobiomodulation over cryotherapy. So let's get into how are you going to use our Bioflex equipment. For this type of application, you don't need to use the laser probe. We're just going to be using the dual array, which has uh, super luminous uh, diodes are similar to LEDs, a little bit more powerful, and they have red and infrared uh, output. So in order to accelerate muscle tissue healing and reduce inflammation and help with overall muscle recovery, I'm going to recommend that you do treatments daily um, and specifically right after the exercise. So maybe an hour or so thereafter, you can see how that really does help. Uh, um, and uh, remember that you can do this up with respect to weightlifting, eccentric exercises and intense exercise, and especially for athletes that are doing activities that they're not used to doing as well. Treatment should be initiated, as I mentioned, within a few hours, preferably within an hour of, of the activity if possible. And again, I'm gonna recommend treating three to four days after exercise. So I'm gonna recommend about 40 to 50 joules uh, at each location, uh, and you can apply it to all the different muscle groups that are involved. So this re will require several placements of the array. And again, no laser probe is re required. So one example is if you have the dual 180, you're gonna set it to continuous wave. Uh, for the red, you're gonna set it to 50% power, uh, which gives us about 22.5 joules of energy. For infrared, you're gonna set that at continuous wave, 30% power, and that gives you about 27 joules of energy for a total of about 50 joules of energy over that one area. So in this case, it's two minutes over the muscle tissue before you move it to the next location. Another example, if you have the dual 240, which is our larger array, uh, has more power output overall. Uh, so you're gonna set the red to 50% power. Uh, you're only gonna treat for 45 seconds in this case, which gives you the same amount of energy as the previous example, 22 and a half joules. And the infrared, again, set it for 30%, but change the time to 45 seconds. And this will give you 27 joules for a total of about 50 joules. Okay, so it's squat day today. Uh, not for me, because I don't do weightlifting. I probably should, right? But uh, I do other things. <laughs> so, um, okay, so today's squat day. That's great. You're going to do your squats. And guess what are you going to do? Well, within an hour of treatment, you're going to apply the arrays up and down the quadriceps muscle. Now, I'm six foot five, so my quad is longer than maybe someone that's five foot tall, right? So you might have more placements for a taller person. Uh, if they're really muscular, which is not me, then you might have more placements as well, but you want to make sure you cover the entire quadriceps, uh, from its origin to the insertion. Okay. So that might take four, five, six, I don't know, depends on the size of your body or your patient's body. So again, I'm going to customize the protocol. Um, so you might have four to eight placements and the total treatment time is going to be around eight to 16 minutes. If you have a dual 180 and about six to 12 minutes for the dual 240. Now that's total treatment time to treat the entire quadriceps. So when you think about it, it's a quick treatment. And what I'm saying here is that if you work with athletes or you work with sporting teams or what, or whatever, you want to promote this is have the athletes come by or go to the arena or whatever, and, uh, and do this. It takes like a fairly short amount of time to treat these athletes. I mean, you could charge 10 bucks, 20 bucks, whatever it is, uh, whatever makes sense. Um, 10 bucks might be a little, <laughs> a little on the cheap side, but uh, you know, it's a good way to uh, improve your return on investment and, and uh, help your bottom line as well. So this is what the protocol would look like. I saved it as a muscle recovery protocol. Uh, in this case, I did quads. I chose the, the dual 180. Uh, and four placements. If you have the newer software, it's pretty similar. There's not a whole lot of differences there. So just to see what it looks like, uh, I have eight number of steps. Remember, I'm gonna have red infrared for each step and four placements. Uh, so the first step is 50% power, continuous wave, one minute duration. And then the second step is dual infrared array. Remember that's continuous wave, now 30% and one minute. So I'm gonna repeat that now up until eight steps to do four placements over the quads. So that's what the protocol would look like. You would customize that in. You can do it for your 
hamstrings, your biceps, your deltoid, whatever muscle groups you're doing eccentric loading training on, uh, and you can treat those areas. I didn't put in the, the parameters if you have the uh, personal home system. Uh, it would be pretty similar to that. I just, this is more of a, a focus on our professional equipment. But if you do have that interest and you have the personal system, which by the way, would be a great uh, recommendation to loan out uh, to, to athletes to use, uh, then you can also set that up as well. It's pretty simple to do. Okay, um, wow, we went through half an hour pretty quickly. Uh, upcoming trainings uh, this Saturday, live from Dusseldorf, Germany. That's where I'm gonna be on, on uh, unfortunately in Germany, because now they have like crazy COVID there, but uh, I'm going to a conference there, uh, but I will be doing it live uh, from Germany, uh, live to you, wherever you may be on November the 20th of Saturday, nine to four. If you haven't signed up, you can still do so. And then we have another uh, live online training in December and, uh, note that we're going to be doing our first in-person live training back in Toronto uh, in January. So if you're interested in coming to Meditech, seeing what we're all about, uh, enjoying a full day of training, um, then I encourage you to sign up for that event as well. Don't forget, we have a aging and cosmetic uh, um, uh, advanced training on December the 4th. Guest speakers are uh, Dr. Ben Ewan from Halifax, uh, Dr. Slava Kim, our clinical director, and uh, myself. And I'll be talking about everything from acne, um, uh, skin lesions, aging, um, you know, in general dermatological problems, uh, and just helping overall with wellness of the body. Oops, that's a repeat. I guess I didn't check that out. Okay, well, listen, thanks for listening. I do appreciate that. You may have a few questions. If you want to contact me, my email is david at bioflexlaser.com. Okay, so don't see a lot of questions here other than a question about using the personal therapy system. Um, and if you have questions specifically about using the personal system for what I've just gone over, just shoot me an email. I'd be glad to, uh, to, to discuss that. I just didn't have the bandwidth. Uh, no pun intended or pun intended uh, to talk about that today. Uh, thanks again. Uh, whoops, let's see here. I think that was it. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining me today. And our next webinar, even though it's not posted on the website yet, but I uh, have uh, submitted it, uh, it is on a year end uh, discussion of all the research that happened in 2021, including neurological problems all sorts of really fascinating topics of what they're using photobiomodulation for. It will be a one hour webinar uh, to celebrate the year end. And my guest speaker is Dr. Randy Santiago, our clinical research director. Um, and he'll be presenting a lot of neurological papers. So um, if you have a chance, uh, please join us on that date. I forget the exact date because it's in December, <laughs> um, but you can check on our website shortly and it should be posted. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day. Bye now.